Okay, so as I said before, if you need a loo, if you just want to go, I will not be offended. Feel free to leave and do what you need to do. Okay, so down here we have the rear fuselage of NX611. So this is in our fuselage jig. So this jig was built by Intellect Engineering uh, with us, all designed and everything with us to enable us to do the rear fuselage work. This was actually produced during the, the COVID year, if you want to call it that. Um, so winter 2020, I think it would be. We removed the rear fuselage from NX611, uh, brought it down here, uh, constructed the jig, and then lifted it all in the jig, drilled everything off to make sure the jig would fit NX611. And that was before we had the opportunity to use the KB976 rear fuselage. Um, so the, the aircraft part came off, went in the jig, everything made sure it fitted, and then it went back onto the aircraft. Purely because, because of COVID, we didn't have the funds to actually start work on it. Uh, quite fortuitously then, KB976 opportunity arose. Because the jig had already been made to fit NX611, we knew that if we could make KB976 fit the jig, then it would then fit NX611. So KB976 came was put in the jig, all the work done, back on, now we're here. So NX611 came off, it's been put back into the jig, and because of the experience we've gained from working on KB976, we're going to approach NX611 slightly differently. The biggest problem with NX611 is, is twofold. Number one is magnesium rivets. So majority of wartime aircraft were built using rivets of a magnesium alloy um, material, which means that over a period of time, the magnesium kind of destroys the rivet because it is open to the air and elements, um, and that the rivet just pops. So the head pops off and the, the stem corrodes away. So all of the rivets have got to be replaced on this rear fuselage section. The second problem we've got is because poor old NX611 has had a busy life um, and been modified and adapted over its service career, it also has quite a few problems on the lower formers inside the fuselage. So if you want to take the opportunity at some point to have a look down the centre of the fuselage, all the formers on the inside you'll see are quite badly damaged, they've had holes drilled in them where a piece of skin's been placed um, and various problems like that, they're slightly bent and damaged so a lot of those have got to be repaired or replaced. So what we've learned from doing KB976 in the jig we will apply to NX611 so we will have in the next week or so um, somebody come along to produce two more parts of the jig and that's going to be a top spine and a, a bottom spine if you want to call it that so as you, you look at the, uh, the fuselage end on, you'll see the top skins have been removed and the bottom skins have been removed. That's to allow us to, to place a, a spine running fore and aft um, on the jig and then from that we will have plates that come down that mark the position of each former. So what we can then do is we'll remove all the skins, remove all the stringers which run front to back, <coughs> so like an angled piece that runs front to back, and then we'll remove all of the formers. So it will be completely broken down into kit form. So back up to here, we restored that section during COVID um, and then to the rest of the, the section that we have to do. So all of that will come apart and it will be on the bench. When it's on the bench, everything will be assessed for serviceability, be assessed whether it can be repaired or it needs to be replaced. Um, it will be completely paint stripped, let's say assessed, surveyed, and then built back up again in its assembly and then placed back into the jig. So with those top and bottom spines dictating the position of each former, we'll be able to fit each former individually onto that jig and then put the, uh, the stringers into place um, and then skin round. By way of stringer, the Lancaster has different size stringer depending on which piece of fuselage it is. Couldn't make it simple and just use one size of stringer. Um, so the rear fuselage and the nose have a, um, a thin stringer, if you want to call it that, a smaller stringer. So that means it's slightly thinner material and the, the legs are slightly shorter in both directions. Um, so back in 2019, I think it would have been, we ordered a load of new stringer sufficient to, to if we had to, replace all of the stringer in the rear fuselage and in the nose of the aircraft. So we have that stringer on the shelf. It was extruded in America. So extrusion is um, aluminium forced through a die of the correct shape in one length, heat treated, and then sent over. So because of the length of the stringer, we had to have it done in America, because British industry as it is, there's nowhere in the United Kingdom that can produce a stringer long enough. Um, it's not the, the length 
of extrusion that's the problem, it's the heat treating, the solution treating of it once you've produced it. So in the UK we've only managed to find a company that can do it as long as three metres. So in old school, ten foot. Ten foot length items, which of course the stringers in this are well, about 19 feet or something. Um, so they just cannot be produced in the UK. So we had to have those extruded out in America and flown over. Um, of course, they're really long but really thin. So you've got to pay for the amount, the amount, amount of shipping for that amount of cubic um, cross section. So expensive item to have done, but it means we've got it on the shelf ready to, uh, to do the project. So as I said, it will come completely apart. New pieces <coughs> placed in where required. Original items reused if they can be. New formers produced if they can't be. So when we uh, did the work on KB976, we had the formers on N NX611 scanned to produce the wooden forms. So we will be able to use those again to produce new formers for, for NX611's work here. Um, a few things we've already found wrong with NX611. So these sit underneath the aircraft, just up in here. That there. There's three of them. And these are made, made out of a magnesium alloy again. Um, and because they're magnesium alloy, they've started to be eaten away by the elements and they're, they're very badly corroded. Luckily for us, we do have a spare set of these. Um, so we will have to use a spare set of these um, fitted to NX611. But it's small little things like this that if you haven't done the, the work beforehand, you can soon slow the project down completely while you try and find or wait for an item uh, on the shelf to be able to refit. Um, those magnesium alloy items, in order to produce new ones of those, we would have to have them drawn up. We would have to put in a modification for a change of material because you would, there's no way you'd use magnesium alloy for those anymore. You'd use aluminium. Uh, and then we'd have to have them cut on a, a, a CNC machine. So I would imagine an individual item like that could probably cost us three grand, something like that. So you can see how costs can soon mount up, because that would all have to be milled from an individual single billet. You mentioned the magnesium alloy rivets. Um, are you, you said it was difficult to get it on them. Are you still, are you going to use them now? No, the magnesium alloy rivet was going away from altogether. We're going to aluminium rivets, which are a purple-headed rivet. Um, on NX664's wing behind you, uh, we do have some magnesium rivets we put back into that, uh, purely because we had a big stock of them and cost saving and that kind of thing. So it's not going to be airworthy. So the biggest problem with magnesium alloy rivet is when it's not properly protected. So over time, if the, if the paint comes off it, or in wartime construction methods, it's very unlikely that they actually painted the inside of the, the wing, for example. Um, so that magnesium alloy is just open to the elements all the time and will corrode a lot quicker. Um, modern ways of doing this, when we use a, a Duralac jointing compound, it's well painted. Those magnesium alloy rivets now won't cause a problem for, for the French going forwards. Um, but because ours is going to be flying, we're going to use aluminium rivets, which is the purple colour. So when you look at the, the wing behind you, when you have a look around, the green ones are magnesium alloy, um, the purple ones are aluminium. Do they drive the same? Um, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the, only really, the only time you really have a difference is um, if you get a really big aluminium rivet, it's quite hard to drive. Yeah. Um, they work hard and very quickly. Yeah, they do. There's quite a few rivets on this that are actually um, heated. So you, you heat them in a kiln, um, and then you drive them in and then they age harden after they've been worked. Um, so obviously they're very soft to then drive, but you generally do that with the bigger ones or the ones that have got to be in a, a stronger section. So the, in the tail, the, the item which holds the tail oleo, which I was talking about before, those are all heated so that you, you cook those rivets and then you form them when they're hot and then they cool down and they harden off. And that's obviously in a very strong section within the, the tail of the aircraft because it holds that oleo and has that, that bad landing action that it needs to, uh, to take. So what's your time scale for doing this section here? This year before next, I've, next I've, winter? I've told the airframe guys that I've got 10 months. <laughs> not to say they accepted that, but that's what I've told them. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. We, we won't truly really know how long it'll take until we get it apart. How much beer did you give them when you told them that? Well, they can only have it afterwards. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll only know when we get it apart. The beauty of doing it the way we're doing it, we're not strict to a time schedule on this. 
if it takes more than this year and runs into next year, it doesn't matter because the aircraft is still yeah, taxi. Everything else gets delayed. Yeah, it all, everything keeps going. It just has a, a knock-on effect depending yeah. on what other projects are being done at the same time. Ten-year plan is out the window. Yeah, yeah it extends slightly. Yeah, so um, once this is finished, um, it will in theory come out of the jig because we will have received the midsection from France, WEU21, and then this jig will be adapted to receive the next fuselage section. So we know that that cruciform former on the front, which are bolts to the front face of the rear fuselage, will fit in mirror, will fit the rear face of the next section. So that will either stay there or move to the back. And then we, we know that we have a form for the rear face of the midsection, which will fit the front face of the rear section, to then form the back of the, uh, the jig. So it's likely that the vertical will move the, uh, the lifting will be um, extended and uh, a slightly different size fuselage section and then this will form the rear of and the, uh, the front of the, the next fuselage section. Uh, we'll make the jig fit the French fuselage section. We'll just tart it up for taxiing depending on what needs to be done to it um, and then we know that the jig will be ready for NX611's mid fuselage section to go straight in and be worked to airworthy. Um, ready for refitting to NX611. Um, so very early days with this, we've only just started stripping some skins off. Um, over the next few weeks and months you'll see it come apart and uh, packed in a box um, and then uh, everything assessed and starts to be built back up again. How many rivets? A Lancaster as a whole is a million rivets. Um, I forget how many they said there was in the rear fuselage, about 11,000 I think in the, the rear fuselage of KB976. But um, yeah, Avro seems to have an addiction to it, of putting a rivet either every inch or every half inch. They don't seem to really um, remove themselves from that ruling. So as you can see, it's every inch going forwards and then where the, the skins meet, so where's the skin overlap, they thought every inch isn't good enough for there, we'll put it every half inch. Very much overkill. Do you have to grind the heads off the rivets? Do you grind them off or how do you get them out? No, you, you tend to just drill down the centre. So okay. some people will use a punch to punch the centre and then drill down with the correct size drill bit. Um, other people will just drill sufficient of the head so that the head is not strong enough anymore and, and then it. they just take it off with a, um, I don't know, like a chisel almost. Um, it, just it, to knock the head off. It's a long job, just drill them out, let them put the new ones yeah. in. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the danger you've got with drilling out rivets is if you drill too far, you suddenly, if you're not straight down the centre of the rivet, you'll screw up the skin underneath because it'll make the hole too big or string. make it into a snowman shape. A stringer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hopefully just the skin. If you go through the stringer, then you're all right. Butcher. But Your jig, very accurate. CAD modelling from, uh, sorry, 3D modelling from what you've got now, but not all Lancaster are built on the same jig. How's the compatibility of parts fit likely to fare between the aircraft? Yeah, so NX664, which is which is the French one, W21, was built on the same jig as NX611. Oh, that's lucky. So that's in theory, NX611 could, it, could easily have got that wing, but he got that one. Yes, you know what yeah. I mean? yeah, that's yeah. all the bar parts were produced and they were, re they were assembled. So, in theory, they'll just fit. Yes. We didn't know whether the Canadian built KB976 would just straight fit on mm. the British built NX611, but it did. So, it seems like, although some slight differences that we know about, it seems like the major sections were built to the same jigs so that I guess war damage. Yeah. They could easily just go, oh, well, there's a rear fuselage over there, we'll fit that. Yeah. We know that this wing of WU21 has got a Canadian built trailing edge and aileron. So that suggests that a Canadian built item will fit on a British built item without any problem. And in theory, we'll see. Well, we'll find out, yeah. yeah. So if you all want to turn around and look at the wing, so that's the wing of. Uh, and it's 664 WU21, however you want to turn it. Um, so this wing came over from, from France. They hadn't touched it since the aircraft was recovered off Wallace Island after a bag um, taxiing from landing accident. So this is how it came to us. Um, we built a jig, put it in the jig, uh, started stripping it apart. So again, pass those around. It suffered an awful lot of corrosion to it. 
um, through just normal skin corrosion and the similar corrosion between steel and aluminium but we've busted it right down into component parts and, and then we're building it back up again so where things needed repairing we've repaired them um, and because this is just for taxi income static condition we've been able to repair things where on NX611 we would really have to replace them because they're good enough for taxi and good enough for staffing, but they're not good enough for airworthy. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a few bits there. If you're handy, could somebody pass me those items on there? Oh, yeah, everything on there, thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to show you a few items which we've had to remove from the, uh, the French wing so you can see problems with keep going, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we've had to replace them, and these are the problems we find generically with, with old aircraft and aircraft that have been left outside problems from um, steel and things like that which will happen to every aircraft depending on the conditions it's kept in. So these are um, items which wrap around the landing light on the wing. So we've got a steel ring which is held within the wing and then we have an aluminium shroud for the light itself. This is aluminium, this is steel, this is rusted and this is corroded through dissimilar corrosion. So where the aluminium meets the, the steel, they react with each other, somewhat like a battery, um, and they just corrode away. The aluminium usually suffers worst, and you can see that's completely eaten away where it's come in contact with the steel. Another item is this. This is what you call a, a barrage balloon cutter housing, I guess you'd call it. Um, so this sits within the leading edge of the wing. One aperture is here so inside of that there's a small um, jaw if you like so it's like a hooked jaw so what is supposed to happen is if you fly in a you fly through a barrage balloon wire cable it runs along the leading edge of the wing so from, from that end this way comes into the actual jaw within the the housing so the cable runs up hits the jaw it hits a trigger within the jaw which fires um, effectively a shotgun cartridge which then fires a massive bolt that comes out and cuts the cable mm. so in theory the cable runs in and gets cut by the bolt that comes out I think there's about three of these on a, a Lancaster wing but again they're steel so that steel has reacted with the the aluminium leading edge eaten away the leading edge uh, and caused problems in that way as well you also find a lot more magnesium alloy on the wing so this is in the trailing edge this is the very the furthest edge of the trailing edge, so the very edge of the wing as you see it. And it's a magnesium alloy um, extrusion or casting that runs down the, the entire length of the trailing edge. So I'll pass that round, but I do need it back, please. <laughs> so you'll, you'll see that magnesium alloy um, is used throughout the aircraft. In fact, the wheels on a Lancaster are made of magnesium alloy as well. And generally, wherever that magnesium alloy is, if it's been open to the elements, it's corroded away. Have to have new ones extruded. Yeah, we'll have to have new items of those made. It's, it's likely they'll not be magnesium alloy, they'll be um, aluminium. Yeah. Uh, but we, what we need to do with that, this is, this is the difference between making something airworthy or just restoring it. Because we've got to make, we're going to make the aircraft airworthy, in order to find out what material that was and the properties of it, to therefore replace it with a new material, that item's got to go away for uh, testing. So it's got to be destructed to find the, um, the the elements of it to find out how strong it was in different planes for want of a better description of it to then work out what new material you need to use which is as strong or stronger than the original material but then the new material you use has got to be able to be formed in the same way as the original material to justify being able to use it as well yeah so you, you so you find out what the original material was you work out what new material to use and then you go to um, a company like 145 company to do the, the stress analysis um, and modification. That modification is then um, effectively sent off to the CAA uh, for approval if it's a major mod or just goes in the, um, the normal documentation for the company if it's a minor mod. Um, and then that gives you approval to change the material and then you've got to find a company to actually do the work to produce the new item. Does that apply to every item being structural or not structural? Yeah. yeah, so you can get blanket modifications for all of your skins. So they don't make the original British aluminium anymore. So you have to use 
basically a, it's basically an American equivalent. So it's Six effectively pretty much the same material, but it's an American produced rather than British. Produced. So that's a blanket modification. So all your skins, regardless of where they are, can be replaced from L145 to 2024 T3, whatever. Um, then when you get down to more important things in more unusual areas, so areas that are taking a greater amount of stress and things like that, you then have to go through the, the mod, individual mods for the individual items. Um, so as an example on, on this wing, so the final piece to go in on this wing is the former, or the rib, that fits on the very end. And that's rib 22, which is this one here. This is held together again by cooked rivets. So the rivets are heated in the kiln, fired in, and then they age harden as they cool. So this sits on the end of the, uh, the wing. It bolts down to the, um, the spars themselves. So as you look down at, at these wings, at the very bottom has the spars, which are like an L shape, and then the web between them, and then the, the ribs come up from there. So at the end of those spars, you have a big bolt that goes through from former 22, rib 22, down to the spar. And that's the bolt that holds it in. You see, that's not quite straight anymore. Mm. Uh, when we took those out, that took 16 tonnes on a hydraulic press to press that out of the, the former and the spar. So that's going to need a new one of those made. Because this is just for taxiing, officially we don't have to find out what the material is. But luckily we've got the drawing which dictates what the original material was so we can have new ones made. But if, we, if it took 16 tonnes to take this out of this wing, you can bet your bottom dollar it's going to take 16 tonnes to get it out of ours. Yeah. So while we're making one for this, we might as well make our own for NX611 as well. So that sits through a steel plate like this. This isn't as it originally would have looked. So it, it sits through that steel plate, up through the spar and into the, um, into the rib here. So these steel plates are what are holding us up at the moment. You cannot get a steel modern equivalent to this original steel for some reason. So you can see on these, these were smooth at one stage, um, but they're steel and they've corroded as they've gone. Where there was a mating face, so where there was, for example, a washer which sat on the steel, it's perfectly good. Where the rest of it was open to the elements, it's corroded away. And that one around there is wrong. Again, I do need these back. So were these special steels or just because they're wartime, surely it wasn't an option for these it's, it's amazing what materials there were wartime that they just don't make anymore. Is that mm. it's, the hat to have it at hand or the shows up material? It's just a material that was in production at the time. So those are just basically the shims for want of a better word. Mm. Um, they screw down to the aluminium spar and then the bolts run through them, so like a strengthening plate. Um, but because you can't get the original material anymore, you have to send the item to be tested, so instructed, um, tested, find out what original material it was if you don't have the drawing. And then you have to find the modern material which is in production with equivalent or better uh, properties than the original to have a new one made. Mm. But because of the war in Ukraine, the majority of Europe's steel comes from a company in Ukraine. Mm. I think it's Mariupol it's at. And because of the war, there's no supply of it. So we cannot at the moment get a steel piece required to make a new one of those. So what section, that, that bit there, what section is, is that? Is that of the main uh, wing or is that the... Yeah, so that, that bit sits... It sits on here, which is the, the, what's that, the rear spar, yeah. lower boom. Um, there's one top, one lower boom. There's also one on the uh, front spar, top and bottom, right. front and back. So what you see now with, with the wing is all the, uh, the top skins are on as far as we can go. We can't progress any further with top skins until we've put this on. You can't put this on until we've got that plate made, because oh. that needs attaching to the spar first. And then we can put the rib on, and then we can put the rest of the skins on. We can close in the, the fuel tank area. So the big gaps you see in the wing are where the fuel tanks sit. Oh. They have like a, a structure, a square structure, which goes around it to add strength. Um, and then we can put the um, leading edge on. So the leading edge, and this is one of the things we found by doing the French wing first. Mm. We originally attacked the wing in completely the wrong way, because we thought that you basically built up the individual components to the wing to complete it. Where actually, 
it was produced slightly differently. So the leading edge and front spar was produced in a, as an assembly, which is what you can see in front of us here. So this is the front spar, the, uh, the leading edge ribs are attached, um, the stringers are attached in, the skins are put on, the skins then come over, overlap the spar and hang down slightly. That assembly is then lifted on top of the, the main plane assembly and, and bolted down to the ribs and riveted on from there. So you build the assembly separately. We've also found that each rib was built as a separate assembly. So in the, um, the factories building parts for Lancasters, there have been somebody sat at, sat at a bench producing rib number 28, day in, day out, all day, just re re producing these ribs in a separate little jig on the bench. So bringing together extruded parts, skins, trimming to fit, riveting together, putting it in a box. The box was then taken away to the assembly plant where all the ribs were then put in to the, uh, the spar section which had been produced on another jig somewhere else, all brought together, all the stringers put in place and then there'd be somebody just firing skins on, riveting skins on all day to build the wings up. So it's very much built like, um, it's, it's how industry changes, car industry changes changed when Ford came along and they did the, the big production line. It's all produced in small assemblies and then brought together as one major assembly out the door to be fitted to a Lancaster. So the, the leading edge here is just waiting for some more um, stringers to be fitted and cleats to be fitted. These are cleats. They basically attach the rib to the stringer and there's hundreds of these. So these have all got to be married up in the correct place. The, um, the new ribs we've made here will have to be um, cleaned up, painted and then riveted in position. And then we can then start to fit the skins on this and then lift the, the leading edge on. One of the big problems, I say it's not really a problem, but it's a, something they did in production with Lancaster, which isn't brilliant for us now, and that's the use of a plug rivet. Mm. So as you look down the, the spar, whether it's the leading edge or the, the trailing edge spar, there's a lot of holes in it. And those holes are where you put a rivet. But those holes don't go all the way through the material. They go part way through the material. Normally with a rivet, rivet you, go, you put a hole all the way through the material, you action the head of the rivet and you put a block on the bottom of the rivet and it closes it all up and then sandwiches everything together. On the spars they decided to use something called a plug rivet and that, with that plug rivet you basically drill a hole through the material but it doesn't go all the way through it, it goes into it so it's a bottomed hole and then you thread it, so you tap it so you put a thread into that and then you fire a rivet into it and the rivet, the action of the rivet spreads into the thread. So it effectively becomes a form of a screw, I guess you could say. Um, so that's a, a production method which isn't used anymore. So we have to train in firing in plug rivets. So we've had to have taps made um, to recut the thread within these. So although these have already been tapped because of the paint and everything that's gone in them, we have to re-tap them to make sure all the thread's good within the hole and then we can reapply a new rivet. The actual way to remove a plug rivet is to drill a small hole in the head of the rivet and they say use the tang of a file in the hole and turn it out like a screw. We actually found that a hex head um, piece for a screwdriver, if you, you drill a small hole, hammer the hex head in, you can then un um, unscrew the, the plug rivet. The other problem of course is with corrosion, some of those plug rivets were corroded away um, which has in turn put corrosion in the hole as well. So we need to re-tap all these holes before we can um, put the new rivets in. Each tap, which is about that long, with an Acme thread, which is a, a, a strange thread, it's a very coarse thread, was hundred and hundred and ten pounds per tap. A little piece of metal that long, we, we had to get ten taps just in case someone breaks them. We actually sent the drawing off for the tap to a, a company that make taps day in, day out. And they said, are you sure you want these? Because they won't work. <laughs> because, well, I said, that's strange because they use them several millions of times during wartime and they seem to work fine then. <laughs> but they're saying that because the, it's a bottomed hole, mm. that as soon as you go down to the bottom of the hole with such a coarse thread, the tap will break. Because it's gonna, it's gonna hit the bottom of the hole and then the stress is through the tap. It's a very brittle material, that tap, and it will just snap the tap. We've used them before, it, it should be okay. <laughs> um, so, do you do those mechanically or by hand? Manually, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So, so I can it, see it, their point. I feel if completely. Will, if they're yeah. on machines without torque limiting. Yeah. 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 So it'll be completely by feel. Um, one, unfortunately, one engineer will do the whole lot rather than um, <laughs> no pressure there. Trying to get, yeah, <laughs> trying to get several people uh, training how, how in. How deep are these holes that you're tapping? Well, I don't know, between a sixteenth and an eighth of an inch, I would say. Yeah, I mean, you'll be able to see, you can see the bottom of the hole when you look in it, so it's not very far. And a lot um, of hours. A lot of hours, and yeah. A lot of hours. And with, with the, with, when you put a, a new rivet in, a, a, so a new plug rivet in, the original manual says, I think it's every, every seventh or fourteenth rivet you've got to do, so you put them in here and then you put it in a piece of material beside you, an inspector would come along, inspect the rivet, dissect it, and make sure that it formed correctly in the, the thread, because you can't see it. Mm. It's within the material, you can't see it's been done correctly. Um, but obviously they're important enough, they're not just stitching the skin to the spar, they must be important enough that they have to be formed correctly within the thread. So you have to measure the depth of the hole and work out how deep the thread is to know what length of rivet to put in the hole, mm. so you've got the correct amount of material to react to the inside of the thread. More fun. <laughs> now the Canadians were clever, they used screws. How long did it take to assemble one of these I don't know actually. That's a good question. I don't know how many they were making every every week in the factory of these. Quick the blanket the question for a mod. <laughs> yeah. Well we had looked at that. We had looked at whether we can do a mod. It would be a major mod. Uh, but you could use the Canadian as a, an example as to why it would work. Um, we for NX611 are going to have new spars made purely because there's a, a type of corrosion called intergranular corrosion. Intergranular corrosion is like um, it's almost like a wormhole, so a worm casting a hole in the ground. And the fact that it starts to bury in and it just keeps going through the grain of the material, um, which is why it's intergranular. Um, and you, you can't, generally, you can't get rid of that. You end up grinding all the material away to get to the bottom of the corrosion um, hole, um, so there's no material left. Um, so that's kind of the worst type of corrosion in that respect. It's very hard to actually get it all out. Um, so we've found intergranular corrosion in the number one tank bays on the Lank. Um, so we're just going to have new spars made. Um, the good thing for us is the Battle of Britain flight have, um, are limited on the number of hours they can fly on their Lancaster before they have to change the spar because they're governed by British Aerospace. We ourselves, in, in discussions with the CAA, they basically said if you replace the spars to a new material, you will have unlimited hours. There will be no hour check on the, on the main spars. So that means that we should be good for, for many, many years to come uh, by replacing the, the spars. If we decide that we want to try and keep as many of the original spars as we can, you've then got a, a big case to write to justify why you can keep that original spar, what's happened to it over the last 80 years, and justify why it's okay to keep it. Um, so what we have here is the main plane. The wing is in two sections in the fact that there's the, the main plane and the trailing edge. So the trailing edge holds the aileron, uh, the flap, and that comes from the bottom, effectively the bottom of that wing as we see it, down to a taper. Um, and the, the trailing edge for this wing is on the next jig over, although it just looks like two big booms and some boxes of bits because it's in component parts. Um, that yeah. attaches, so the trailing edge attaches to the, the main spar by a special stud like this. It's a double-ended stud. So the long bit goes through the spar and with a nut on the end, and then the, the, the smaller bit goes through the trailing edge spar with a nut on the end. And if you, did you ever hear of the Canadian Lancaster wingtip folding up in flight a few years ago? We well, did. Um, it'd be quite scary, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, they looked out the window to see the wingtip hung up in the airflow. Um, and that was due to a failure of these. So these had stretched, so the, the length had stretched and snapped, which allowed the, the wingtip to fold up. So these are all, a, again, a drawing made of a special material. Uh, we've had new ones made for the, uh, the wingtips, and again, we'll have to have new ones made for the trailing edge, I suspect. These are steel, so we've had a few that have snapped as we've undone them, for example, or are corroded, so they've lost enough of their strength that you have to replace them. I'm not going to send this one round. Um, <laughs> clearly because it's the only spare I have. <laughs> are they special steel? Or what yes, they're special steel, yes. yes. Um, they, <laughs> they probably, yeah. Um, we had these made prior to um, the war with Ukraine, so whether, whether we'll have, be able to get some new ones quite easily, I'm not too sure. 
Um, but yeah, so that's where we are with this wing. This wing will be um, ready to fit, all being well, fingers crossed, uh, next winter. So winter 2023. Um, so our port wing will come off, go in the jig, have this entire process done to it to restore it to airworthy. While we've had these spars from the French Lancaster here, we've um, scanned them, 3D scanned them and had uh, computer models made of them. So when we come to have new material produced for the spars, um, we can have it produced as per these. And these came off the same plant as NX611, so in theory they're identical um, spars. So this will be built up, fitted to NX611, trailing edge will be built up, um, and then we'll restore ours. The wing tip's already been done, so both wing tips are restored. Um, and then once our wing goes back on, this port wing will go back to France, and on the return journey with the transport, we'll bring the starboard wing, start it all over again, um, at which point, of course, we're also progressing all the fuselage work as well. Um, and so eventually, hopefully, in another five years' time, we will have restored the Lancaster back to airworthy condition. We just need a few of those steel plates to throw the heads up again and <laughs> reduce things to a, a walking pace, though, I'm afraid. So. Have, have you resolved how to manage the, the really, really big bit, the centre section and time out of service? I have some ideas, but they're not formed sufficiently to be able to communicate them yet. Right. But, uh, yeah. but, uh, I mean, worst case scenario, we will have to stop taxing the Lancaster for a year, 18 months, and do the centre section and cockpit at the same time yeah. um, with two different teams working them. But uh, that's worst case scenario. Yeah. And then there's all the little bits like um, bomb doors and undercarriage valances and undercarriage doors and all that sort of thing, which will be progressed piecemeal through the few years coming up. What's the timescale now? It was a 10 year plan. I mean, yeah, so we're five years into the 10 year plan. So is it still a 10 year plan? Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're hoping that see, our 10 year plan allowed for perhaps having to do the rear fuselage over two winters because you're going to get half of it done. Then you're going to have to put it all back together again, taxi for the summer, take it apart, do it again. So hopefully, with the introduction of doing this principle of borrowing bits to then take hours off and do them over a whole year, we can still hit our target. I mean, the 10 year plan, they, never, they say a plan never um, survives oh, contact with the enemy, don't they? <laughs> so um, we will see how we get on. But we're not, I'm not, we're not going to break our backs over reaching that 10 year point. If it takes another year, it takes another year. Um, it's not going to matter too far much. Is, far as it is, even with Covid, you can't be where you are. I think so, yeah. I mean, who knows? In, in the final year, we've got to do what um, the REF do with a, a major servicing. So it's all got to come apart for inspection, NDT work, and everything. Um, because the CAA have said, okay, so you've done the fin in year one. When you get to year 10, what is it to say that the fin is still airworthy? Yeah. So you, yeah. you've got to then re-inspect everything and it starts from, from dot again in that, that final year uh, to make it airworthy, paperwork all done. It's not, not airworthy until it actually flies and survives its test flight. So, that's <laughs> bad terminology, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it'll be after its test flight that it'll have everything signed off and, and deemed airworthy. So the, the, the funding is all done by the operating of the centre. Um, we have uh, the, the membership to the centre, the Just Jane Supporters Association, um, just general admissions to the museum, the taxi rides, and we also have something called the Rivet Club. The Rivet Club is a... Any, hands up, who's a Rivet Club member? Oh, well, thank you very much. So those of you that know, the Rivet Club is a, a monthly donation to the, the project, anything from three pounds upwards. Um, and for that monthly donation, which is a recurring card payment, uh, you get in the winter you get weekly uh, newsletters email newsletters that go out to inform you of all the things that's happening you get neville's videos on them who uh, neville makes uh, youtube videos um, so they're all linked on there and in the in the summer period it goes down to monthly normally e emails um, and all that fun those funds go towards the restoration of the lancaster that's earning the center or the project around 70 to 80 thousand pounds a year at the moment so it is making a, a big difference. So that's three pounds a month, 10 pounds a month, whatever anyone's giving, it is adding to a, a much bigger picture and really helping to fund a lot of the work that's going on. Um, so yeah, it's, if anybody wants to come along with a, a check for four million pounds, then uh, <laughs> I will gladly receive it. But un until then, it is all everybody's individual efforts and, and help that they're giving the centre and the operating of the centre. That cup of tea you're all gonna go and buy after this talk just to give you that caffeine boost to wake you all up again. Um, that all goes to help this project to restore the Lancaster to Airworthy. So the whole thing's about four million pounds, 10 year project of which we're halfway through. And thank you very much for, for supporting it and coming to 
listen to me, I know it's painful. And for those of you who've returned, you must have something wrong. Um, but thank you very much. It is very much appreciated. I know I, I jest about it, but um, your support is very much appreciated. And um, it's all going to end up with us having an airworthy aircraft unless something stands in our way. But by all means, do have a good look around the engineering area here. Have a look at what's left of the trailing edge before it's built back up. If you didn't get to have a look in the rear of the Lancaster, I'll go back over there and by all means, um, poke your head in again. And if you've got any questions, now's your time. <laughs> when you restore the Jane, will it have all three or all six of your tanks, or will you just content yourself with maybe the inboard tank only? No, it'll have all, all the fuel tanks fitted. Um, so number threes and twos are already restored to airworthy. Number ones are currently away for restoration. Yeah, so they'll all be airworthy and refitted. An aluminium tank, they're not a bag tank or anything.